Welcome to BizHack Live presented by BizHack Academy. My name is Dan Gretsch, and this is our weekly webinar series. Goal, with our goal, our mission is to empower businesses with a simpler way to grow. We know digital marketing can be really complex, and we bring in experts and an incredible simple system that will make it easier for you to grow your small business. Today, we're going to be talking about Google advertising and the secrets to unlock, unlocking profitable customer acquisition through Google, both search and paid, uh, with the amazing Jeff Cooper. I wanted to start with a request. This is, uh, we're coming to the end of season three of BizHack Live, our weekly webinar series. Uh, I'm Dan Gretsch, by the way, the founder and CEO of BizHack Academy and the host of BizHack Live. And we'd like your help shaping uh, season four, which will start in the fall of 2021. So um, we're going to put this link in the chat. Please click on it. Uh, go ahead and take the survey uh, while you're on the webinar. It'll, it'll only take you a few minutes uh, and it will really help us understand what you most value uh, out of these free weekly webinars and what you most need uh, as we're planning our sessions uh, for the fall. Uh, so again, it's uh, invite.bizhack.com slash survey, and uh, really would appreciate it, guys, if you could help us out uh, and fill out this survey. Thank you so much. I wanted to acknowledge our partners, uh, Safima, the South Florida Integrated Marketing Association, Interactive Marketing Association, uh, the American uh, Marketing Association, AMA, South Florida chapter, Goldman Sachs, 10,000 Small Businesses, CIC, the co-working space and creation station, uh, another uh, co-working space and incubator in Fort Lauderdale. I wanted to quickly introduce you guys, those of you who are new to BizHack, to our sort of signature contribution to small business marketing, which is what we call the lead building system. All of our curriculum, all of our courses, all of our programs really focus on this lead building system, which provide you a simpler way to grow. We took the complex uh, j jargon and muckety-muck of digital marketing and we boiled it down to the foundation, which is your business story, the six pillars, which are your campaign objective, your target audience, your irresistible offer, your thumb-stopping video, your compelling message, and your call to action, and then the nine-step process for putting those into place, which is what a lot of our programs walk you through. And we have a program coming up uh, on August 30th where we take business owners through the lead building system. If you're looking for a way to get started with digital marketing, digital advertising, running campaigns online, this is a great place to start. We strongly encourage you uh, to scan the QR code um, or to uh, go to bizhack.com, apply now, slash apply now, uh, and join us. This is an interactive session. You know, Jeff it has given this presentation. He knows his stuff. Uh, the more questions you ask, the more valuable the session will be for you and the more engaged you're gonna be with it. The way to ask questions is clicking on that Q&A icon and go ahead and put your questions in there. Uh, I will be managing that and, and Jeff, if it's okay, as you're presenting, if there's a question related to what you're talking about, I'll make sure to, to jump on in. Um, with that, uh, I want to introduce the amazing Jeff Cooper from Saltbox. Um, th these are his bona fides. He uh, is the founder uh, of Saltbox Solutions, which is a pay-per-click and SEO firm. If you don't know what that means, you will know that by the end of today's session. Uh, and I met Jeff actually when he was working at a fast-growing startup where he ran the search engine marketing team, and also help them build a technology that helped them get acquired in 2016. And uh, I'll, I'll never forget, Jeff, when uh, you sat me down and explained to me the incredible thinking behind the Google algorithm. Um, and uh, you compared it, I, I believe, uh, a little bit to a stock market um, and the way that uh, a stock market works. And uh, I've never forgotten that it was one of the most clear, but also sophisticated explanations of Google's innovations around search. And um, honestly, it was really early in my transition from journalism to digital marketing. 
And I will always remember you as one of those key mentors that helped me explain and understand digital marketing uh, in a simpler way. And, and really our goal at BizHack and my goal um, in everything I do is to try to take the complex and make it simple and accessible. And so uh, for, ever since that, I'm like, this guy would make for a great guest for a webinar. If I ever had a company of my own and ran a webinar series, and yet here we are, uh, and we're in season three, and uh, it's my honor to welcome my friend, uh, the, also the founder of the SEO firm that BizHack uses and recommends, uh, Jeff Cooper. Thanks, Dan. I appreciate that. Let me, let me get my screen shared. Can you guys hear me okay? Yeah. Awesome. Well, thanks for that background, Dan. So uh, like Dan mentioned, I'm basically, you can kind of consider me a, an engineering nerd who just happens to be doing marketing. So my education is in biomedical engineering, which just means that my parents are a little bit disappointed with my career path, but I was really attracted to Google as a, as a space because it's so technically complicated. And so for me as an engineer, it looked like a great opportunity to apply a lot of the skill sets more on the technology and the analytics side of things to actually help businesses acquire customers. And it's something that I'm very passionate about and has, have probably spent way too much time thinking about over the last 11 years now. Um, so today we're going to talk how to approach Google paid search in order to develop a profitable customer acquisition channel for your business. Um, what I'll do is I'll, I'll, in this presentation, we've got a lot of content. This, this domain is pretty deep and pretty technical. I will probably stay at a little bit of a higher level than I might normally, since we don't have eight hours today to, to get our PhDs in paid search. Um, but we'll cover four main areas that I think are going to be important for you as a business owner as you're starting to think about making an investment here or evaluating Google paid search as a channel. Um, the first thing we're going to do is spend some time unpacking the basics of how the paid search auction place works. So Google paid search is a little bit different than the organic search or SEO from Google and how they show ads and how they rank different results. And I want to make sure we spend some time really getting into that and understanding that. It, it might seem a little basic, but some of the really fundamentally important things that you as an advertiser need to do to be successful with Google paid search really rely on a key understanding of how that auction works and the different things going on there. Uh, second, we'll, we'll look at one of the things I get asked all the time, which is, is paid search worth it for your business? Is that something you should even be looking at, evaluating? Can you profitably acquire customers? by using that channel and that tactic uh, to drive people to your website and to your business. Third, we'll take a look at one of my favorite things, which is how to actually analyze the search market and how to get data from other people's investments. So before we go spend our own money, let's go figure out what we can learn from other people's money. Um, and then finally, we'll hit on a few key areas that really need to be focused on if you wanna be successful with a paid search program in Google. And at the same time, we'll talk about some of the common mistakes or pitfalls that advertisers tend to come up against. Um, I, I would say that there's probably three things that I see every single time I look at a new Google Ads account um, that we're gonna make sure we spend some time on. So if you go out and do this on your own or whether you're working with a provider already, you know the right questions to ask and the right things to be focused on. Um, so let's dive in a little bit to the, to the paid search auction. So before we get started, I'm sure a lot of people are wondering, why am I so obsessed with Google? Well, uh, besides the fact that I use like 90 of their products in my day-to-day -day life, Google really has a dominant market share in the search market. So depending on what data sources you see, it's about a 90% plus of people use Google. There's, when you're looking for a question, you don't pick up your phone and say, hey, let me bing this real quick. You're going to Google it. And, and Google has a massive ownership of that search market. So as an advertiser, even though there are other platforms out there like Microsoft Ads or Bing, or if you're in Asian markets, Baidu is very popular, or sometimes there are some new uh, merging technologies like DuckDuckGo that are search engines that are designed to, to maximize privacy. Um, those are all good channels to look at, but I really recommend that you focus on Google first. If you can get things to work in Google, it's very easy to replicate those things in other search engines like Microsoft's Bing, or uh, something like Baidu if you're, for some reason, doing business in China. Um, there are a lot of different ways to compete in search engines. So it can get really complicated very quickly. What we're looking at here is just the search engine results page or the SERP, you might hear me say, for the word dog food. So if you Google dog food, there's a lot going on 
when you actually look at the results that Google gives back to you. Um, there are paid search ads, and this is what we're going to be spending most of our time on today, which are these first results that show up at the very top of the page, and they're all text driven. A lot of traffic, depending on the keyword, maybe 20 to 30% of the clicks go into these top listings. And on mobile, that's even more exaggerated. If you're on your phone and you Google something, you'll probably only see ads until you scroll quite a ways down the page. Um, there are some other things on this page I just want to point out so you guys are aware of them that we won't go as deep on today. So the second thing is there's also Google shopping ads. So if you're an e-commerce business, you might participate in this market. On the right side of the page is where Google will show ads for specific products. And that's run through a tool called Google Shopping. We're not going to go super deep on that today. What you should know is it's very similar to paid search in terms of how it works, whether it comes for how you pay for the traffic or how Google runs those auctions. Um, but what we're going to focus on today is paid search. The other two things on this page that are relevant for you guys is typically there's a part of the search engine results page called the map pack. And this is, if you're a local business, really important to you. This is where you show up if you're looking on Google Maps or if, or if Google thinks your query in the search engine is a localized query or, or local results will be relevant for you, you'll see this map pack show up. That's managed through a tool called Google My Business. We won't go in depth on that today. Um, there is also an advertising component that when you're using paid search, you can actually help your listing show up in the map section as well. And we'll talk a little bit about that later. Um, finally, there's the organic search results. So this is everything that's not an ad. So it's not your paid search ads. It's not your shopping ads. All these listings that show up lower on the page. When someone's talking about SEO, they're specifically talking about trying to rank your website well to, on these organic search results. So like I mentioned, today we're going to focus primarily on this paid search component. The reason I like paid search so much is first, you'll notice it's the first thing on this page. So it tends to get a lot of visibility with prospective customers. It also gets a lot of click volume and interaction from people who are using Google. The second reason I like paid search is when you compare it to something like organic search and you're a new business or you're a smaller business, it's oftentimes a lot easier to drive traffic and sales faster through these advertising components. The way the market works is it enables us as an advertiser to show up tomorrow and drive traffic to our website tomorrow if we wanted to. Whereas when you're working on something like SEO or organic search, it can take a much longer time to get to see the results of your efforts. And so I usually look at paid search as a, as a jet ski if SEO is an ocean liner. And, and paid search has a really good value proposition, which is you can very quickly and immediately drive visibility for your business in these search engine results pages without having to work on a six month or 12 month content plan to try to show up on the organic side of the house. Um, so let's go a little deeper into these paid search results. So what's crazy about paid search, and this is part of why Dan's analogy at the top of this session is so, is so apt for this, is that every single time a user goes to Google and searches for something, Google runs a live auction so every single time, whether you're Googling dog food or you're just looking for a babysitter, Google's going to run an auction with all of the advertisers that want to show ads for those search queries. And we'll walk through how this works step by step. So first, when someone Googles a query in, a, in the Google Ads platform, which is the platform you as an advertiser use to manage all of your investments into paid search, Google says, who wants to show up for this query? And it looks at all of the advertisers that are using Google Ads who have told Google, I want to show up when somebody searches for dog food. And in this example, I just have four theoretical advertisers here who might participate in this auction. So these four companies have decided they want to show up when someone searches dog food, and they've told Google that. The second stage is Google actually asks all of the companies and advertisers participating in this auction to bid on the keyword. And so what that means is, Google is asking you to tell them how much you're willing to pay for a click on your ad. Um, and so the good news is this doesn't happen uh, in live time for you as the advertiser. It's not like you need to sit in Google ads and like eBay, you know, hit your bid on every single search that comes through. This happens programmatically. So these advertisers ahead of time tell Google, I want to show up for dog food and I might be willing to pay $3 for the click or $5 for the click. You'll sometimes see things like CPC. That stands for cost per click. And that is the, the price you pay if someone clicks on your ad. 
those click prices can vary quite a bit depending on the keywords you're targeting or how competitive your market is. But you as an advertiser, when you want to participate in this auction, you declare the keywords that you want to show up for. And then you also declare your bids through a through what's called a CPC bid or a cost per click bid. Um, this is great, but it poses a little bit of a problem for Google. So, so Google makes a lot of money off ads and they would like to keep making a lot of money off ads. But the number one thing that's important to them as, an, as a platform in which we can advertise is they want to make sure that they have a really quality experience for their users. They want users to find what they need and come back to Google. They don't want them switching to DuckDuckGo or going over to Bing. And so it's really important to them and they're incentivized to make sure that these advertisers are not just spending a bunch of money and taking over the results page. They also want to make sure that there's a really good quality user experience for people who are participating in the auction. And so once an advertiser places their bids, Google then scores each advertiser for their user experience on their ads. And they do this through a metric called quality score. So basically to, to make it really simple, quality score is just the quality of your advertising experience. Now underneath the hood, there's a lot of things that go into Google's calculation of quality score. It can be things like how relevant is your ad copy to the search query? If I searched for dog food, I would like to see an ad that talks about dog food and not an ad talking about cat food. Um, another example of something that goes into that is your landing page user experience. I'll, I'll stay on the same example. If I search for dog food and I click on your ad, I would like to land on a page all about dog food where I can see and shop for the thing that I looked for. That seems really obvious, but sometimes people just send that traffic to their homepage, which creates friction for the users who are actually looking for a specific product or service. Um, and then the final piece of quality score that they look at is they look at the historical performance of these advertisers and they look at how often their ads are interacted with. And they look, it's, it's something called the expected click-through rate or how many times historically has your ad shown up and people clicked on that ad. And they use that as another signal of quality saying that, hey, our users have decided this was a good result because they've interacted with the content on this page. Um, so once this happens, you essentially get to a situation where Google now knows all the advertisers who wanna show up for this search query. They have a bid from each of the advertisers that tells Google how much everybody is willing to pay for a click to their website. And then they have quality score, which is a metric of how qualified and, and good the user experience is from all these different advertisers. So now Google has to decide, well, how do we, how do we rank these ads on this page? We have a bunch of people wanting to show ads for the same keywords with different bids and different quality scores. Um, the way that Google does this is they actually take these two metrics, your, your CPC bid, so how much you as an advertiser are willing to pay for the click, and they take your quality score and they multiply them together. And this is a metric known as ad rank, where essentially what Google is doing is they're saying, we're going to equally rate how much you're willing to pay for a click and how good your user experience is. And we're gonna combine those metrics to determine whether we show you on the top of this page or not. Um, and so what happens is in this example that we've run through, um, it's actually advertiser B who shows up first, even though they were, if you look here, they were actually willing to pay the least amount for the click. They said they only wanted to pay $3, whereas advertisers A and D were willing to pay more money. But because they had a good qualified user experience, they had really good ad copy, really good alignment with their landing page, Google rewarded that quality and actually showed their ad first, even though there were other people in this auction that were willing to pay more for the ad. So this is, this is really, really important. And the reason I like to sort of harp on this basics of how the auction works is this slide essentially can tell you the three things that are most important to your business if you wanna play ball in Google paid search. So the first thing is corresponds to this first item, which is making sure you pick the right search queries that you as a business want to show up for. So let me give you an example. If you were running a premium dog food company and you only provided raw dog food, you might not want to bid on the word dog food. It might be too broad and too competitive, whereas you might want to bid if someone's looking specifically for raw dog food. Um, the second thing that this makes pretty evident is you need to understand how much you're willing to pay for clicks to be profitable. Um, a lot of times people start doing paid search and they're like $3 cost per click. I can't possibly afford that. I only sell something worth $50. And so you need to make sure you're ready to think about whether or not you can, you can compete on some of these keywords based on the price of those clicks that you can afford as a business. 
And then the third thing that becomes most important with paid search is the quality of your user experience. So like we've seen from this example, uh, if you have a high quality score, you can buy a lot more traffic for much less expensive and you can actually outcompete people who might be spending more money than you by having more relevant ad copy, a better experience on your website and just providing a good, a good user experience to the users who are searching for these things. And so later in this presentation, we're gonna go over kind of how to think about picking keywords and figuring out what search queries you should go after. We'll also talk next about how we figure out how much we can afford and whether or not we're willing to pay for these clicks at certain price points. And then finally, we'll take a look at some of the more advanced optimization strategies you might do once your campaigns are live. And in particular, quality score becomes very important. And if we have time today, I'll, I'll, I'll even dig into the platform and show you how some of this stuff uh, works under the hood. Um, and if, if not, you'll have to come back to next season's BizHack and we'll, we'll go into it. Um, let me pause here for a sec, Dan, in, in case there are any major questions. This is relatively complicated in terms of how these auction works. And there are a lot of important implications for you as a business owner or an advertiser. So it's really important. You don't need to be a, a Google engineer, but it's really important that you just fundamentally understand how this auction process works because of so many so many factors that influence your performance as an advertiser, as a business. Yeah, um, Grant and Amy are kind of asking a similar question. Uh, Grant asked, does Google tell you or give you insight into your quality score so you can make changes to make it better? Uh, Amy asked, do advertisers have visibility into quality score? Yes, absolutely. So, so we do have visibility into quality score. And later in this, in this presentation, I'll show you where you can find that if you have an active Google advertising account. So what's interesting about it is, is Google doesn't actually show you the quality score by default, but if you know what you're doing, you can go into that platform and, and see those metrics. Um, let, me, let me underline this. Um, you should ask your agency to show you the quality score on the ads that you're running if they aren't already. So even if you're not running your own ads, PPC can get pretty complicated. Uh, you wanna keep an eye on your quality score the other thing I just wanted to say, and this I, I remember um, was one of the big insights when Jeff and I first were talking about this years ago, is as in this example, Google is leaving money on the table to give a better user experience, which means a better ad first. And Google is playing kind of a long game uh, in that they are willing to lose money in the individual auction transaction to give the higher quality content first. And I really think that it's Google's focus um, on user experience that has helped it maintain an incredible lead in search engines when the cost of switching is nothing. All you do is instead of writing google.com, you write duckduckgo.com or bing.com and you're off to their competitor. So part of what makes Google's dominance in search so breathtaking is that they've been able to maintain that lead and still create a, a ton of advertising uh, above the fold. You know, when you on our desktop, are doing a search, if it's a keyword that's at all popular, you're bombarded by ads. And yet nonetheless, it's still uh, winning in the search engine race. Uh, I think that's pretty extraordinary. It's kind of an, a magic trick, if you will. It, it, it's interesting and it, and it can be somewhat frustrating as an advertiser because the other part of that is, is they've done an amazing job of gamifying advertising. Um, this process is relatively complicated and this process we're talking about happens for every single keyword on every single search. And so as an advertiser, unlike a billboard or a radio ad where you can just place that ad and reap the benefits of it, um, you have to actively manage this because these prices change as advertisers come in and out of the marketplace. Your quality score can change as your website evolves or as other advertisers participate and start working on their ad copy. And so it creates a, a double-edged sword, whereas if you know this stuff well, you can get a really non-trivial advantage in the paid search market space, um, but it's, it, it creates a barrier to entry. It almost makes it, it, it makes it so challenging as a business owner, if you just wanna run a small campaign to do this without calling someone who actually understands this stuff because of how technically nuanced it is. And so 
Um, it's a little bit of a double-edged sword, and Google has been very good at, at making sure the quality of the market stays good while also incentivizing us as advertisers to all compete with each other and, and spend a lot of money with them. Yeah, you're, you're making a great point, which is one of the reasons why in our Digital Marketers Edge course, we don't teach Google advertising to start. We, focus, we start with Facebook is because this is not a simple or easy platform to learn. Um, and what's interesting is Google has created some products that are intended to make this process easier. But in my experience, the results are not great for the businesses that use those. Um, and it's a little bit of a conundrum because Facebook, I think, has done a better job going down market to the really micro enterprise and the small business and creating a platform that a relatively less resourced company can use. Google, I think their tool is more complex. I sometimes joke that Google's ad platform was built by Google engineers for Google engineers. Um, we have a great question from Jane Moore. Um, with regards to improving your quality score, is it better to create a specific landing page that's specific to that ad or just direct them to a relevant page inside of your existing website? Yeah, um, I would say, so this is really, to me, more of a trade-off call on your own bandwidth and ability to make that content. I think in an ideal world, the, the more relevance alignments you can have, the better. So in an ideal world, if you had 50 different keywords with 50 different ads, you'd like to have 50 different landing pages that all line up really nicely and specifically with all those targets. Now, in the real world, that's totally unpractical. Like I'm not, <laughs> I can't manage 50 pages. So it might be that you want to have um, you know, middle ground, maybe you have two or three thematic landing pages that you can use for three to 10 different keywords. Um, ideally, the more specific to the search query, the better. And, and outside of the Google world, if you just think about it as a user, like if you, you should make the page that you as a user want to see if you search for that thing and clicked an ad. And if you're looking for a, you know, a specific product, don't, don't send that person to a page that doesn't have information about that specific product. That's frustrating and they're going to leave and it's gonna hurt your, your performance in the long run. So ideally, the more segmented your content can be, the better. Um, you'll have to make a decision with your business as to the trade-off calls in terms of how viable that is because it is time consuming sometimes to spin up pages. A lot of times what we'll do when we're in that situation is we might make a landing page template where 90% of the content stays the same, but we spin up some smaller versions of it so we can just tweak a little bit of the content to make it more relevant to search queries without having to rebuild the entire page every time. So we have a, a number of questions. We'll run through them pretty quick, Jeff, uh, so that you can get back to your presentation, but um, address these great questions. And guys, keep them coming. These are fabulous. Uh, Juan Matos asked, to obtain a high quality score, is it better to be much more specific about what you want to advertise? Absolutely. Yes. So, yeah. so the three things just as a, just the three things that go into quality score. One is the expected click through rate of your ad. So that's all about having engaging offers, good branding, good messaging in the content of your ad. The second thing is the ad relevance. So you get you get bonus points if someone searches for dog food and your ad doesn't say dog food, you're not going to get as high of a quality score. Um, so it's good to have the language specifically in your ads. And then the third thing that goes into that calculation is the landing page user experience. So if you're using a bunch of pop-ups on your landing page, Google won't like that. If you go to your landing page and there's no way to actually purchase or submit an inquiry for the service that I was looking for, Google won't like that either. So those are the three things you need to pay attention to. The quality of the ad copy, the relevance of the ad copy, and the landing page experience. Yeah, and generally speaking, resources aside, because it takes a lot of work to do this, the, the narrower and more specific your ads in the landing page, the, the better they'll perform. Um, this is part of why I use the hedge fund analogy. If you look at, so we have some clients who spend over $100,000 a month on paid search. And for those, those businesses, they might have 2,000 active keyword targets. And it's almost more like you're running 2,000 little campaigns, all these little funnels with keywords and ads and landing pages that you're trying to both optimize and make them all perform better. But you also have to make decisions about how much money you put on these keywords versus the keywords over here. And so that's where it can start to, to get complicated. Um, my general suggestion is if you're first starting out, 
I would really focus on a, a very narrow subset of search queries and try to get those right. Maybe pick two or three that you feel like really align with your business and just focus there so that you're not having to worry about the overhead management that comes with having 50 different keyword targets in your account. So come rapid fire questions uh, regarding historical uh, previous uh, click through rates. Uh, let's say your key, our keywords haven't performed well in the past. This is from Scott Philhaber. Is it better to remove those ads altogether and start over? Um, maybe. Uh, my suggestion would be you, you definitely need to reproduce those ads. Whether you're iterating on them or creating a new ad is up to you. My best suggestion for that is take the keywords that you're targeting where you're seeing a poor click-through rate performance and go Google them and go look at like what are the top three ads showing up in the Google results and don't, you know, don't copy everybody, but if those ads that are showing up one, two, and three are doing something with their copy that you're not doing, maybe they have an offer baked in. Maybe they use certain language that's really inspirational or catches the eye. Try replicating some of those things from some of those top advertisers. And, and whether you nuke the ad or whether you rewrite it is up to you, but you're probably better off uh, starting fresh and looking at the search results for the top performers for those queries that you've got a poor performing ad for. And just go see what they're doing. You might find that they're doing some things that you can really easily replicate. Audrey Salazar asks, can you see what others are bidding before you determine your bid? Um, yes and no. So um, Google will provide to you and we'll look at this later, a range of click costs where they'll tell you, here's roughly what it costs to show up on page one, or here's roughly what it costs to show up on the top of page one. And so you can get a sense of that from Google. There are also some third-party research tools you can use to figure out you know, roughly what people's quality score is, but you don't have pure visibility into it. I can't say, hey, advertiser A has a quality score of four. I can't see all that information, but I can sometimes deduce that from how much my clicks are costing, where I'm ranking, um, et cetera. But, but no, you can't see explicitly um, those metrics. So you can't see their quality score. Can you see their bids? Can you see what competitors are bidding for keywords? You can, you can get estimates of those. So Google will give you a range of, Google will tell you two things, basically. They'll say, here's how high you need a bid to show up on the first page, and here's how high you need a bid to show up on the very top of the first page. And so those two metrics can give you a sense of probably everyone is bidding somewhere in between those values on the first page. Great. So if there's sort of two aspects to the game, the quality score and the bid, um, there's a little bit more visibility into the bid. The quality score is, uh, you can see it for yourself and not for others. And even that is a little bit of a black box. Yeah, and there are some things that you can do if you know how to navigate Google. And if you're working with an agency, you can ask them for this data to, to get a little more details on your quality score, which will help you actually take action on that. Uh, how many paid search ads is typically three to five, depending on the, the query. But usually it's not more than about three or four at the top of the page. And then sometimes there are some ads that show up at the bottom of the page. Um, awesome. Well, let's let's move along. What we'll do is so so now that we have a, a basic understanding of how this auction works, the, the question becomes, um, can I afford that three dollar click? That seems expensive, or maybe it's a one dollar click or a five dollar click, depending on your industry. So how do you actually go about as a business figuring out if this is even something you should bother testing or looking at, or whether it'll work for your business or not? Um, Really, the, the answer to this question is somewhat simple, but getting the, getting the answer is, is a lot more complicated. So there's a very simple question you need to answer as a business owner, which is how valuable is a visit to your website from a potential customer who's actively looking for your products or services? So one of the great things that I love about Google is you know, compared, to, compared to social advertising, if you're running a Facebook campaign, that's a person who's probably sitting on their couch scrolling through Facebook and you've got to entice them. Like you, the reason BizHack focuses so much on the story and the core messaging is in the, in the scroll stopping videos is that you have to actually, you know, that person isn't looking for you and you're trying to get their attention and tell them that what you have to offer is really valuable. With, with paid search, it's a different landscape. Like I'm, I'm as a user already looking for your products or services. 
So it's not like I'm, I'm just sitting on the couch and not thinking about you. I'm in the market. I'm trying to buy something from you. And so you need to figure out as a business, how much money would you pay to get me who's looking for your services to show up to your website? Um, usually what I recommend is that you break this question down into sort of two sub questions that you can start to do a little bit of math. I promise we won't do a ton of math to, to help figure out whether or not this is a viable strategy for you. Um, so the first one is, is really important. My hope is that as a business owner, you've already thought about this some because of it's, it's probably a core part of your entire business model, but how much money do you make if a visitor on your website becomes a customer? If you're an e-commerce company, so for instance, let's say you were sell, selling wedding stationery online, this is very easy because I can see how many people on my website purchase. And when they purchase, there's, a, there's an average order value associated with that. And it's very easy for me to just say, okay, let's say I sell stationary, I sell it for $30 and it costs me $15 to make. Well, I just made $15 every time I get a new customer. That's, that's pretty straightforward. Sometimes you have a more complicated business. So let's say for instance, you're a health and fitness studio or you're running a gym. You might sell memberships and you might have members that last for 12 months. And so if you charge $30 a month and your average member stays with you for 12 months, your customer value might be more like $360. Um, some people don't know the answer to this question and they get really, really hung up on it. My suggestion, if you're in that boat, is to, to just put your best guess together and do an estimate of, of how much money, how much profit will you make if you get a new customer. And even if it's an estimate, that's okay. We just wanna make sure we, we have something solid to base some of our bids off of. And we need to make sure we understand how much money we make when we get a customer. Um, the second piece of this equation, which is a little harder as a business owner, you've probably been thinking a lot about number one because you put your, together your entire business based off this thesis. Uh, the second one is how many website visitors who actually get to your, to your website on average will become a customer. So again, if you run an e-commerce business, so like let's take the wedding stationery company, this is probably easier for you because you're probably tracking this already. So if you're running a shopping store, you probably already know that maybe I have a 2% conversion rate or a 3% conversion rate on my website. If you're not doing that, you should either look at any current analytics you have on your website, or if you're working with an agency, they may be able to tell you what your average sort of conversion rate is on your website. If you don't know this at all and you don't have any data, just use an estimate. There, it's pretty typical that about two to 5% of the traffic that you send to your website will turn into a customer or a lead if you're in the business of driving like inquiries through a form or a phone call from your website. And so if you don't know this answer already, I would suggest using a two to 5% range to estimate how many people who get to your website are actually gonna take that key action where you can start interacting with them or pull them into your sales cycle or sell them if you can sell through your website already. Um, so this, this can get a little, a little tricky to think through and it's different for everybody, which is part of why this it gets a little complicated. Um, what I wanna do is run through just three examples of different types of businesses and how we would think through those questions to actually get to the answer of how much money are we willing to pay for a click. So this first example, really easy. We're an e-commerce website. So let's pretend I sell socks. I sell packages of socks for $50 and it costs me 50% of that to make the socks. So that's a pretty easy answer to the question of how much money I make when someone becomes a customer. I make $25 when they become a customer. And because I have an existing e-commerce site, I might already know that my conversion rate is 4%. So 4% of the people who get to my website actually buy those socks. And so what we do is we take that, that dollar value that we're willing to pay for a customer and we multiply it by the assumption of the website conversion rate to get to the value of how much money we'd be willing to pay for a click. So in this example, if we paid a dollar to get a prospect for our website and one out of 25 people turned into a customer, then we would on average expect to spend $25 to acquire that customer, which is perfect based on the targets we have as a business to maintain our profitability. So this is the easiest example. Let me give you a few others just to, just to get you guys thinking if your business is substantively different. So let's say I have a friend and she runs a B2B consulting service. And so she works with clients who pay her about $2,000 every time she does a project. And it takes her about 10 hours to do that project. Her financial target is she wants to make an effective hourly rate of $150 an hour. So what that means is if, if she wants $150 an hour and she's expecting to worth 
work 10 hours, then we need to make sure we don't spend more than we, uh, you know, that, that amount of money, 150 times 10, uh, plus the acquisition cost to get to that $2,000. So for instance, let me, let me make this more simple. So I want to make sure we, we retain $1,500 on the sale so that, that my friend can pay herself at $150 hourly rate. So in this case, we'd only want to spend up to $500 to get that customer because we need to leave $1,500 for that hourly rate calculation. Um, and so in her case, she's got something even more complicated. You can't actually buy her services on the website. When you get to the website, you fill out a form and then she talks to you and sells you her services. And so she doesn't know these numbers exactly, but she was estimating that she thinks about 5% of the people who get to her website will actually fill out the form about the services and she'll close about 30% of those people that she talks to. And so again, if we take that $500 times 5% times 30%, we get $7.50, which is how much she'd be willing to spend to get a qualified prospect to her website. Assuming all those, all those percentages hold up, she would then not pay more than $500 for a new sale. Um, and finally, I'll go through this one real fast. Uh, we, we talked about the gym. Let's say I'm a gym, I do $30 a month memberships, and I wanna make sure I get back my investment in a new customer within three months. So I know my customers stay for 12 months, 18 months. I'm willing to spend three months of revenue on the acquisition. And in that case, they might just say, I'm, I'm, I'll pay $90 for a sale. In this scenario, let's assume they had a 10% web to lead rate. So 10% of the people who get to their website, call them or fill out a form and their sales team closes about 20% of those leads. So we can do that math again, the $90 for a new sale times 10% times 20% to get to the price that we'd be willing to pay to get that user to our website, in this case, $1.80. So I realize that this gets a little nuanced and complicated and for everyone's business, this is different, but it's critically important that you as a business owner at least have a plus or minus 50% view of how much you're willing to pay to get that qualified prospect to your website, um, which is what we're trying to ultimately calculate through this exercise. Um, so once you do this, you know exactly how much you can pay for clicks. Um, and like we talked about before, we, we tell Google how much we're willing to pay for a click. So as, long as, so as long as we know what we can afford as a business, that gives us some guardrails where when we actually go to advertise, we know how to manage those investments properly. Um, so then the question becomes, can you compete? And what kind of keywords should you be bidding on. You already know your business well enough to know how much you'd be willing to pay to get somebody to the website. How do you actually go about learning from the search market, checking out your competitors and seeing what they're doing to figure out what kind of keywords you want to use and how much you're willing to pay for those clicks? So I'll pause for a second. There are a lot, there are a lot of sources of data for search engine marketing. So if you're trying to research keywords or click costs or traffic volume, there's probably 20 different tools out there. These are my favorite over the last 10 years, having used them. Google Ads provides a keyword research tool that we can pop into if we have time. I'll probably won't pop into it during the presentation, but if it comes up in Q&A, we can, where you can look at some of the trends in terms of traffic volume or the, some of those click cost ranges that we talked about that'll teach us whether or not we can afford to pay and target some of these keywords. Um, there are also some other third-party tools, SpyFu, SEMrush or SEMrush, Ahrefs is another one where these are third party data aggregators where essentially they constantly scrape Google and try to figure out who's showing up for what keywords and how much money do we think they're spending on these keywords. And using tools like this can really help us figure out what to do, also what not to do. Um, so I'll give you a few examples and I won't pop out of the presentation, but if you guys want at the end of this, we can, we can pull some of these up and, and kick the tires a little bit. Um, in this example, SpyFu, uh, I just did, this was from a keyword research we were doing for a company of ours that, that is in the pet food industry. And we're able to use a tool like this to see all the top advertisers who are bidding on the word dog food, but we can also see their specific search queries. So for instance, like we know that they're looking for fresh pet or dog food brands or dog food. And those are the things these advertisers are spending money to, to get traffic from, from Google. Um, I said I wouldn't pop out, but I can't help myself. Uh, you get a lot of data from these tools. And so for instance, this is Zazzle, which is in the um, kind of wedding industry or stationary industry. And so you can see, for instance, if you were that stationary company and you wanted to see everything Zazzle is spending their hundreds of thousands of dollars on every year, 
you can quickly see all of these different ideas for different types of stationary that you might want to replicate. But you can also see things you might want to avoid. So if we get down in this list, we see, oh man, a lot of people are searching for cheap stationary. If we're a premium brand, we probably don't want to pay for those clicks. So it can help us figure out not only what to target based off what our competitors are spending money on and give us ideas for the user experience, but it also can teach us what not to target. So, hey, we want to make sure now that we know so many people are looking for cheap stuff that we explicitly do not target those types of keywords. Um, the second thing you can do is use uh, Google's keyword research tool. So I won't go into this one, but within the Google Ads interface, you can use Google's keyword research tool for free. There's one, there's one catch, which is that you have to actually set up a Google Ads account and put your billing information in the account. There is a way you can trick Google Ads where you can set up a bogus campaign, put in your payment information, and then immediately pause it. And you'll have an active account that you can actually use these tools for without spending a dime. So um, I think this is one of the, the best sources of data. And even these third-party aggregators will actually look to Google to pull in some of this information. And this is what we were touching on before when people were asking about click costs. In this example, I've used Google's keyword research tool to look at the AC repair keyword. And it can tell me some really interesting information. Not only does it tell me seasonal trends. So for instance, people are looking for AC repair in the summer, surprise. Um, but it also tells us these click cost ranges. So these two arrows that are being pointed out here, one is the top of page bid low range and the top of page bid high range. So for this keyword, AC repair, there is a massive range. Like people can show up on page one with $9 clicks and show up on top of page one with $60 clicks. This is not usual for every search market, so don't panic. What's probably happening is, is that there's probably a really, the fact that this spread is so big means that there's probably a lot of variance in the different quality of the advertiser's user experience because some people are able to show up with a $10 bid whereas others are having to bid 58, which means there could be an opportunity to actually just have a better quality experience and be on that lower range. Um, what you usually see for most industries, by the way, is somewhere between $1.50 and $6 for clicks. It's, it's highly unusual unless you're in certain highly competitive spaces where you have PE backed firms investing in this stuff to see $50 plus click costs. That's unusual. So I hope my slide doesn't scare you guys off. Um, so there's two things I really encourage people to, to look at. So when you're doing this keyword research, what you're trying to do is before you spend any of your money, you're trying to find the keywords that you want to target and you're looking for two things. One, the business relevance. And this is, this is important because if you think about what we talked about in the auction, Google is where people go when they're shopping. And so just because something is relevant to your business doesn't mean it might it's relevant in this context. And I'll give you an example. So let's say again that we're, well, I'll use the dog food example since we've talked about that so much. Um, if someone's searching for dog food, they're probably trying to buy dog food, which means it's a really relevant target for me if I'm selling dog food and I want to show up for that. If somebody's searching for pet nutrition, even though it's very similar to dog food and it's like kind of relevant to my business because I sell dog food, that person might not be a relevant target at this stage in the buying process. Like they're not specifically looking for my products. They're trying to educate themselves on what they should be feeding their dog. And that's something we might wanna stay away from, even though it's, it's somewhat relevant to our business. So when I say relevance, I mean that it's relevant to our business, but it is also somewhat transactional in nature. The, the user is trying to buy something and we're looking for search queries that indicate that. Um, and then the second piece is the click cost. So the whole reason we did that exercise on whether what we can afford is to figure out whether or not we can compete on these terms. So uh, as an example, if, if we were an AC repair company and we did the math and said, we can only afford $5 clicks, then we should not bid on AC repair because a $5 click is too low to get us into that first page of the auction. And so we use those two things once we go through a research process to figure out where are we actually going to compete in the paid search market. And picking those keyword targets is really important and it, it can kind of make or break whether or not you perform well. So you want business relevance, you want it to be transactional if you can, so someone who's close to the point of buying and you wanna make sure those click costs are something you can afford, which is why we did the exercise of figuring out what we'd be willing to pay for. So um, let me pause for a second, because I know we've got 10 minutes. 
Um, and I'm I, what I'll do is I'm going to hit probably the high level um, areas that you as an advertiser need to be paying attention to. And I will probably um, I will probably go quickly and then let us use more time for Q&A and you guys can pull me in the direction that you want to spend some time on. So um, just a quick budgeting question. Uh, Maria Luisa Castellanos asked, is it a mistake to give Google a monthly budget rather than a click cost? Hmm. Yeah, so, so the way that the click costs work is every single keyword has a, has a CPC bid. So you, you as an advertiser are forced to give Google a budget, either a daily budget or a monthly budget on your, your campaigns. But then every keyword you're running does have a cost per click bid. Um, the only distinction is you might not be able to see it. So... Google has all of these automated tools, like Dan mentioned, where they'll do automated bidding for you. So you don't have to worry about any of the click costs. And if you have that setting turned on, you won't actually be able to see your bids, even though they exist under the hood, just Google's taking care of that for you. Um, that type of automation can be really useful uh, when an account is more mature. If you have a brand new account, sometimes it's hard for Google's robots to figure out what's working and not working because they don't have a lot of data. So usually what I recommend is that people use a manual bidding process to start in their campaigns so they can actually see and cap those click costs at the level they can afford. And then as their campaign matures, you can start using Google's automated bidding because Google will have more data. Um, so you're kind of forced to do both. You have to set, no matter what, you're gonna have to set a, a budget cap, a daily um, budget in those campaigns, and you should be doing that. Whether or not you're really hyperactive managing the click costs or not, it depends on the maturity of the campaign. If you're using automation with a mature campaign, you might not need to worry about moving those dollars around too much. But if you're in a new campaign, you probably want to use a manual bidding strategy so you can set those click cost thresholds. Um, awesome. So, okay, first thing, uh, and, and this is basically a love letter to, uh, to Google Ads, it's all of the things that everyone messes up, including myself, the first few times they do a Google advertising account. And they also happen to be the most important things you need to get right to, to be successful. So we'll, we'll spend time on, on four topics in particular that I'll go through pretty quickly. So first is, is conversion tracking. Google Ads has the ability to measure every single web form submission or e-commerce transaction you see from your ad campaigns. And you can associate that data back to the exact keyword and the exact ad and the exact campaign that you're investing in. So you're not flying blind. You, you can start spending money and you'll see what's performing and what's not performing. In order for this to work, you have to set up conversion tracking, which is what Google calls that really well. And so you should be prepared to get a developer involved because it does involve installing code. Um, and you also need to be thoughtful about what you're tracking as a web conversion. So again, if you're an e-commerce business, that's pretty easy. You just want to track when people buy those socks on your website and have your system send that data back to Google Ads. If you're in a business where you generate leads, you might instead want to track things like form submissions or phone calls. And Google actually gives you the ability to install code that allows you to do that. So before you even start, you wanna be really deliberate about making sure this is set up properly because the worst case scenario is that you spend you know, $5,000 investing in customer acquisition and, and at the end of it, you don't know what worked and what didn't work because you didn't have this stuff set up properly. So just make sure you spend some time. You might wanna budget two to three hours for a developer to help you get this right on your website. Um, get your tracking set up properly. There are a lot of different options when you set up your tracking. Usually what I recommend is leaving most of those to their default options for Google. There is one thing I'll mention explicitly here that could be important to your business. If you, uh, Google allows you to count conversions on your website, either as unique to the user or to have more than one conversion for a user. And so what that means is if you're an e-commerce site, you might have a user come from a Google search ad and buy something on your website and then come back later that day and buy something else on your website. And in that case, Google counts both of those transactions and associates it to the Google Ads campaign and said, you got two sales, two conversions from Google Ads. Um, if you're in the business of generating leads and that's how your sales funnel works, like you have a form someone fills out on your website, you probably don't want that setting turned on. So if a user comes to your website and submits a, a form saying they want to talk to you about your services, 
and then they come back and submit another form later that day, you probably just want to count one conversion because it's one uniquely user who's become a lead for you to work. And so that's the only one here that I will just call out specifically. There's a count setting where you just want to make sure you're not duplicate counting different sales depending on how you set up the tracking. So get that tracking right. It, you're, you're, it's going to be a big headache if you don't get this tracking right out of the gate. Um, the second biggest problem I see most people struggling with is match types. And this is, this is a little bit nuanced. So um, Google as, an adver as a platform allows you as an advertiser to set up a keyword target, which is the keyword you wanna show up for, but then it also lets you declare something called a match type. And a match type is the rules through which Google will actually take your keyword target and show you for different search queries in, in that search engine results page. And so this is a screenshot straight from their documentation where the example here is a lawn mowing service. And these different types of match types, broad match, phrase match, and exact match are configured by putting certain annotations in your keyword targets that you can see here at the bottom of this graphic. And they change the way Google behaves when they actually show your ad for, for relevant traffic. So an exact match on the far right is the most strict form of targeting. You're telling Google, hey, if I'm bidding on lawn mowing service, like only show me if somebody's like really searching for lawn mowing service. So that means the exact word or like a very, very close synonym like grass cutting service. And then on the other end of the spectrum, you can have broad match targets, which in that case, Google takes a lot of liberties with what they might think is relevant to your business. So in this example, lawn mowing service is showing up for lawn aeration prices. If you're a lawn business and you don't do aeration and you just do like a quick mow every week, that's gonna be a problem for you if you start paying for those keywords because they're not, they're not relevant customers for you. The thing that also makes this hard is the default match type is broad. So essentially what has happened is Google has set up a system where if you go in and you just type in three keywords you wanna target and you don't use quotations or these brackets to signify that you want phrase match or exact match, Google will start showing your ad for a lot of stuff that may just be loosely related to what you think you're targeting. And this is the second biggest mistake I see people make is they, they do their homework, they do their research, they say, I want to target three keyword targets. And then it turns out they're showing up for like a hundred different things they didn't mean to show up for because they're using that broad match. So be very careful about match types and when in doubt, use exact match. Um, the, there is a use case for broad match, but it's probably more if, you're, if you, you're already driving volume and you're trying to experiment and learn new different search queries you want to show up for, you can use broad match. But I would advise everybody start with exact match or maybe use phrase match and try to stay away from broad match because it can get you into trouble. Um, I'm going to show you guys one thing and then I'll, and then I'll wrap it up. Uh, the quality score, since we had questions about that, um, quality score is in your account. If you have a search account right now, we're looking at a customer of mine who, who volunteered to let us use their data. Quality score is hidden in the account. Um, there is a modify columns option when you're on your search queries report where you can explicitly look for quality score. And you have to add that to your report if you actually want to see it. But once you add that to your report, you can then easily sort all of your keyword investments by cost and you can see the quality score value here. So I know we had a question about that. And so in this case, I have an issue where we have an account we manage and the keyword we spend the second most amount of money on has a quality score of three. And Google's telling us that our landing page experience is below average and our expected click-through rate is below average. So by looking at this data, you can create some really actionable results. So I don't have to sit here and guess like, why is my quality bad? I can actually tell my team, hey, we need to work on the landing page or hey, we need to test some new ad copy to get that click-through rate up. And so this is a really great way. They're hidden columns because Google's uh, all, nothing's easy with Google, but if you find the column for quality score, it can really help you figure out what to go do. And if you're working with an agency, you should just ask them every month to provide you a keyword report with the quality score. And you should be asking them, what, what can you do about this three out of 10? If you have any quality score lower than a six, you should be working on it. Um, and that'll help you save money in the long run. I'm going to, uh, I'm going to not tell you guys about, <laughs> uh, there's another, concept in Google Ads you called- You can go ahead, we'll go a little long. All right, thanks, Dan. Um, there's another concept in Google Ads called impression share that is important as well. So impression share is a measure that Google tells you where they tell you how many times did your ad show up 
relative to the total amount of searches that you could have shown up for if you had unlimited budget or unlimited bids, if you had really high aggressive bids or unlimited budget. And so that seems like an interesting metric, but how do you actually make that actionable? Um, one of the things that I see a lot with paid search accounts is you might be investing in three different keywords and one of them is working and one of them is not working and you've got to figure out what do I do? And the, the question I always get is how far can we push this? Like if we already have a keyword that's working, we want more of that. Like how do we get more out of that keyword? And this impression share metric will tell you exactly how much more you can get out of that keyword. So in this example here, I've just taken a random screenshot from a, an account we manage. And in this example, we've got one keyword on this report that has a cost per conversion of $100 and a 55% impression share, meaning it's showing up about half the time it could show up if it had unlimited budget. And then right underneath it, we have a different keyword that's performing much better. It's a $15 acquisition cost for their customers. And this one also has a 56% impression share. And by looking at this data, it makes it a lot easier for you as an advertiser to make budget allocation decisions. So you might decide after looking at this, hey, let's put this green keyword that's working so well in its own campaign. Let's pause this red one and give the green one all of its budget since we have runway to do that. And that impression share metric is what's gonna tell you how much more you can invest in different keywords. And so that becomes really important if you've got an account where you're struggling to get the volume up and you have some keywords that work and some keywords that don't work, make sure to look at impression share and that can teach you where you need to siphon those dollars in to, to maximize your volume. Um, so this was just a high, high level review. I could probably spend eight hours talking to you guys about any of this stuff. Um, but I think the things that I want to just reinforce and I'll harp on them, these these first three things are the most important things for you as an advertiser. So if you're working with an existing agency, double track how you're tracking conversions. Make sure you're looking at match types. Your keywords are not your search queries that you're showing up for, and those match types can cause a one keyword to show up for a lot of different things, and you need to be careful about that. And then finally, look at quality score. Quality score is the one metric to rule them all. It tells you exactly how Google feels about your click-through rate, your landing page experience, the quality of your ads. And if you do quality score really well, it'll fix a lot of things for your account. Um, uh, awesome. Well, thank you. I'll stop there since, since I've sucked up a whole hour. Thank you, guys. Absolutely. Well, what I'd like to do is I'd like to take a few minutes. If you could go to your um, the data screen, um, and if you could just walk through what you look at in an account, um, I think it would be really interesting just how you look at that screen of data and interpret actionable insights. Yeah, there's a lot going on here, isn't there? I'll tell you what I'll do is let me actually, I'm going to make this smaller and reshare my screen so that I can share a smaller window that you guys can hopefully see a little better. Um, is that a little more legible? Awesome. Okay, so there's a lot of overwhelming information in here. Um, I, there's there's basically a few things I look for, and, and I'll talk you through, and you'll see it, you'll see how it mirrors what I was teaching you guys about. So the first thing I do before I look at any data is I go to tools and settings, and I check out conversions. So this is where all that conversion tracking information happens because before I even look at an account. I want to know what does that conversion metric mean? Is it actually a sale? Is it a form fill? Is it a phone call? Are we double tracking anything that we need to pay attention to? So the first thing I do is I look at conversion actions and I check the sources of data. Where is these conversion actions coming from? What are we tracking? Are we tracking every conversion? Are we tracking just one per click? Is there anything that we are tracking that isn't actually showing up in the Google Ads report? And this is the first thing I do just to understand what the conversion tracking metrics mean when I'm looking at the account. Um, the second thing I do is actually, I take advantage of this report features from Google Ads and I actually create my own report here. And there's a this will be pretty quick, hopefully. <laughs> and uh, I'll show you a little bit about um, the quality score thing that's so interesting. Oh, it looks like I've already done this once. So I'll, uh, I'll show you how to do this from scratch because it doesn't take too long. Uh, one thing I like to do is I like to look at a column chart where I search for the quality score metric and I put that in the um, X axis of the chart. So one through 10, and then I search for my cost or my spend metrics and, and I put this in the Y axis and this immediately shows me a cost distribution of my quality score amongst all my keywords. 
So I can really quickly see how healthy is this account? The healthier the account, the more the lines will move to the right, the more keywords will have high quality scores. But I can see in this account that there are some issues with, you know, we've got some keywords with one, two, and three quality score that we need to flag and look at and try to make sure we can improve the performance of them. Um, and then finally, I would say the last thing, and this is not the, um, there's a lot of stuff I would do in an account, but this is probably the second thing I would do or the, the final thing I'd do just to keep it simple is I look at all campaigns and I go straight to the search keywords. So this is what are the actual keywords you're spending money on them? And I sort them by cost. And by doing this, I can just quickly see where is our money going? And I check for a couple of things here. First, I check for the performance of these keywords. So are these keywords doing okay with quality score? Are they uh, do they have a good cost per conversion? Because I know how much I'm willing to spend on a sale. Is this the right number? And then I also check things like match type. Is there any like rogue broad match keyword in here that be, could be causing my account to spend more money um, than I wanted to? And then the other part of keywords is search terms. Keywords are the targets like broad match, phrase match, exact match. And search terms are the actual search queries that your ads show up for. I do that same thing here. So. Let me take this off. So I'll look at the search term section of the report, sort it by cost, and I'll just say, what, am I at, what are the actual search queries that all my keywords are triggering? And I make sure that these are all qualified, good keywords that I want our business to be showing up for. Um, so that's probably, if I had to condense like a 10 years worth of audit stuff into three things, it'd probably be those quick checks. Conversion tracking, a quality score distribution, so you can see how healthy, and then spot check keywords and, and search queries. And it's important to understand that a keyword is sort of like, I call it like the platonic ideal of a search term. A search term is literally what they type into the box. The keyword is Google's interpretation of that, correcting for misspellings and, and giving a little additional um, context or interpreting of what crazy stuff people write in the, in the search. Yeah, and there's an example where it's like, you know, your, your keyword is not necessarily the search queries you're showing up for. And that's a trap. And Google makes it really, really easy because their default match type is broad. So if you just set up broad match keyword targets, you could be showing up for a whole lot of weird stuff. And, and you should make sure. So if you're working with an agency, they can pull what's called a search term report. So if you're ever curious about how well are your keywords lining up with the actual search queries that you want to show up for, ask your team to pull a search term report and they should be able to provide you all the exact search queries that your keywords are triggering. And I want to just emphasize that point you made quickly there, which is Google defaults to broad match, which is the one that, not surprisingly, will make you spend the most money. And this is one of the ways where educating yourself can really uh, save you a lot of money in the long run. Um, the, most advertising platforms default to settings that make you spend more money, uh, but don't necessarily get you better results. And so just a little bit of education of yourself, like attending a session like this, can actually save you a lot of money and also help you manage. A lot of agencies uh, go to broad match too, um, because they're um, either, uh, it's a little bit more work to go to phrase or exact match. Um, one other quick question I had, uh, there was a plus sign that was in front of some of those keywords on your previous um, page. What, what does the plus sign mean? Um, well, so there's good, the good news, the plus sign is something called broad match modified, which is a certain type of keyword targeting that uses some of the aspects of broad match, but it uses some of the aspects of exact match as well, where the plus term tells Google, well, I'll pull out this one. I'm willing, you can change the word me and you can change the order of this, but let's make sure car inspection and near show up exactly in the search query. And so the good news is that's a little bit nuanced. Uh, broad match modified was just removed um, from the platform last month. And so I think by the end of July, they will no longer be, um, be used. So you don't have to worry too much about those. What I would say is I, I would default to always using exact and phrase match. That's, that's keep it simple. Yeah, just wanted to make sure folks knew that the broad match modified is no longer something you have to worry about. Um, uh, two questions from Audrey Salazar as we wrap up. One is, uh, how soon after starting an ad do you get a quality score? That's a good question. So, so quality score, it requires a, uh, some data before Google will rate your quality score. Usually it varies, but usually it's about 10 to 20 impressions or so. So you should get you should get feedback on that pretty quickly, though it won't be immediately when you start spending, but probably within a week or so or a few days. 
And it might be worth mentioning that Google has something called learning, uh, a learning phase of a campaign. You want to just quickly, some folks might see their campaigns in the learning phase. You'll see this in Facebook as well. What, what's going on when the campaign is, quote, learning? Yeah, absolutely. So, so the learning phase happens when you're using an automated bidding strategy. So like I mentioned, you can, you can tell Google, hey, instead of worrying about managing my bids, I just want to tell you what my target cost per conversion is and you do all the magic under the hood. That can be dangerous if you have a new account, so be careful with it. Um, but when you, when you use those automated bid strategies, Google flags a learning period for the campaign. And what that means is their computer doesn't have enough data to intelligently do what you asked it to do. So they're just going to try a whole bunch of different stuff and eventually train themselves to manage your campaign properly. And so the things you should be aware of is when you're in the learning phase, you can see some really weird performance. And so if you think that's the right thing to do, just be patient, let Google work its magic for a few weeks. One thing you should be aware of is when things are in the learning phase, they can also spend your budget more than you've set. So they won't ever spend your budget more for the month, but if you have a $10 daily budget and your campaign is learning, it's possible that they'll spend up to $15 a day trying to get data they can test with, but they will never exceed your monthly, sort of your daily budget times 30. They'll never exceed that amount of spend for the month. But you should just be aware. It just means Google's learning and they might spend your money a little differently than you'd expect. Just be patient and get through the learning phase and it'll get a lot better. Perfect. And then Audrey Salazar, and I think this is actually a great summary comment almost, is seems like you would have to run multiple ads over a period of time to really understand the search words, the keywords, and the correct match phrases, et cetera, in order to get the results that you're looking for. Would you say that's true? It's 100% true, yeah. I would say that the best thing you can do as a business owner or an advertiser is try to speed up that cycle by using those research tools. Like the best thing you can do is before you spend a dollar, spend six hours digging through everybody else's paid data so you can figure out what your competitors are doing or what you think is smart, what you think is a bad idea. Take some time Googling and see the ad copy so that you start out on your best foot. But you're correct. Like usually for us, and we've got a lot of experience doing this, it, it typically takes us about three to five months to get an account from where it starts to where it sort of starts to level out in performance in an optimized setting. And so it can be laborious. My best recommendation is, is use the research, try to try to speed up that cycle with your competitors' ad spend data so that you can go faster with that. But you're correct. You should probably expect a three, at least three months for a campaign to get set up where you want it. Jeff, thank you so much for a great presentation, uh, explaining some really complex stuff uh, in plain English. And uh, we're going to be back with Google next week, uh, talking about Google Analytics for beginners and advanced uh, with Ben Holland of Q Financial. And then finally, we're going to wrap up season three uh, of BizHack Live uh, with a, a data and analytics session, uh, Fortune 500 marketing techniques that any small business can use. Uh, I wanted to encourage you guys again, uh, it would really help us out if you could fill out this quick experience survey at invite.bizhack.com slash survey uh, as we're beginning to put together great contact, uh, content for uh, next uh, season. Uh, and anyone who does fill that out is eligible to win uh, an Amazon and Visa gift card. Uh, and uh, please join our movement to make marketing simpler at BizHack Academy. You can find us on Instagram and Facebook and YouTube. Um, we have a couple other questions, uh, Jeff, if you're willing to hang out for a few minutes. But with that, I just want to say thank you so much uh, for supporting BizHack and being part of BizHack Live. Uh, and we look forward to seeing you all here next week.